Usually, I give this talk after the film, and the first claim is, well, can we do um, uh, phasors using spectral uh, information instead of a lifetime? Well, the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, and the first thing that I to compare uh, the two methods. So, but consider that we didn't have the film talk. I will try to go again for the uh, explanation that they just did before. So when we have a, a decay, in this case, this is a, a time domain data. This is just a, a drawing, but it's aiming to demonstrate that if we have a short lifetime or longer lifetime in red, when we transform the data in the phasor, this will come up in the phasor as a point, because this is only one point, right? That can be one pixel in an image. And then we can basically uh, find the position if the, the lifetime is a single exponential decay on top of this semicircle we call universal circle that contain on all the single exponential decay. And this relies on the modulation and the phase. And the interesting thing is just by looking the phasor, we can tell a lot of things even without quantifying. What, what are the kind of things that we can tell? Well, first of all, I can tell you that these two are single exponential decay. And these are because they are on top of the universal circle. I don't need to do any fitting. It's just the property of the transformation of the phase. The other important thing that I can tell is that because this is closer to one zero position, this is shorter lifetime than this other, which is closer to zero zero. So lifetime increase in the, in the phasor from here toward to here in a non-linear uh, behavior. Indeed, depends on the tangent on the angle of this angle uh, phi here, right? Uh, and, and as immediately you can see, the phasor here, uh, in the, the change in the lifetime produce a change in the phase or position, increasing the angle or decreasing the modulation. Well, if you if you think in the in the hyperspectral imaging or in the spectra in a cubet, you don't have a pulse and then the decay. You can have position with the maximum in all the range that you collect the spectra. And this is the first difference, right? We don't have a point where the decay starts. Basically, the shape of the spectra is just basically a, a, a chemical property of the molecule chemical physical property of the molecule that we are basically um uh, let me move this out. okay uh that we are in basically studying but still we can do this transformation oh this is me oops Sorry for that. But still we can do uh I don't know what is going on with this now. But still we can do a facial transformation, and this facial transformation basically shows us here, you know, that a position as a spectral uh, data can be translated in a point in a phasor. You can see that now this phasor, instead of uh, only the first quadrant from 0, 1, 0, 1, we are going from uh, minus 1 to plus 1 and minus 1 to plus 1 in the S and, and G. And basically, the position here depends on the, uh, on the, well, the maximum of the spectra or the center of mass of the spectra as well of the width of the spectra. So, the bluer the, the spectra, close, shorter the phase, and the narrower the spectra, basically larger the modulation. And we will describe this in a minute. But so far, we have some similarities and some difference between the lifetime phasors and the spectral phasors. And we will focus on the spectral phasor. The interesting point about spectral phasor and hyperspectral imaging is that we don't need really, really special microscopes. Basically, almost all the commercial microscopes nowadays brings hyperspectral detection in different uh, uh, combi in different uh, combination or in different kind of setting up. But basically, the hyperspectral image means that we have an X and Y 
set of data. And then the third dimension is lambda, is the wavelength, right? And you can see here an image of three fluorophore, one labeled the nucleus, one other labeled some fibers, and then some other organelle, that thing is endoplasmic reticulum, that when we got this stack at different wavelength, some of the fluorophore come up later and some of the fluorophore come up earlier in the spectral range. And this is how we usually acquire the hyperspectral image. To do so, basically, uh, we have basically the detection that can be a single detector or can be an array. When, there, when we have an array, we can collect all the spectral detectors um, all the spectral detectors uh, at the same time, uh, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah, but but basically, uh, we need something else. We need an optical element, which is a, a, a diffraction greeting, or can be a prism, or can be the, the quasar in the case of the um, of the size that will open the fluorescent, right? The emission fluorescent. And then we can pick wavelength by wavelength, right? Or all the spectral together. At the end of the talk, I will introduce a new approach that we can obtain spectral information, not the spectral, the spectral information through the phasor, the spectral phasor, which is you, it, it is done with filters that has a modulation in the transmission. And this modulation is not other thing that a sine or cosine function, but I will explain a little bit at the end. But the point is, for for flim or for for other kind of technique, you need very special uh, microscope. All all the microscope nowadays bring in some way or another hyperspectral detection. Size offer these thirty two channels. Leica collect the spectra one by one. Uh, Nikon uh, has also steps. Olympus has steps. And there are some other bases on cameras in where you have spectrographs, something similar like this, uh, that open and you project the spectra on the chip of the camera and you have really high resolution in the, in the detection. This is an example of a hyperspectral image acquired in the size microscope with the 32 channels. And this is our cells labeled with a, a dye that I will talk tomorrow, Agdan. This dye uh, has the opportunity to change the spectra depending on the environment. And you can see that there are some pixels here that are blue. There, these are the pixels that are earlier, you know, in the collection. These are the first step in the spectra. Then some other are more red. Uh, these are the rest of the pixels here. And how usually the microscope represents the data is assigning a color depending where is the maximum of the spectra, right? But you don't have much much more information about how many more components you have. It's just where is the maximum. If you have another you know component there, you will miss it. So the people usually use methods to uh, uh, overcome this and to understand what are the components on the hyperspectral imaging. And two or, two or three of these methods are the supervised classification analysis, the principal component on the linear mixing in which if you know what are the fluorophore you have in the sample, you can feed an algorithm with this spectra that will tell in each of the channel how much the fluorophore contributes. And by the end, you will have a problem like this gray curve and you can decompose how much you have of each of them. And this can be for two, for three, for many fluorophores. What is the problem there? There is no problem. It's, these, these are excellent methods for you know, analyzing a, a, a spectra flor fluorescence. But the problem is you need a model. And what, what I mean for a model is that you need to know what you have in your sample. If you don't know what are contributing to your sample, you have a problem. What, one can be a, an example of that, autofluorescence, right? We know that autofluorescence is in part contributed by NADH, in part contributed by NADH, but there are many other autofluorophores in the cell. So we need a method, for instance, that can handle with this without an a priori assumption. And these are the phasors, as, as they explained before. Technically speaking, the spectral phasor is basically a rearrangement of the formula that uh, um, they've 
uh, tell, tell before, but you calculate a she and an s. This is a complex number. She basically is the x axis and s is the y axis, is the Fourier transform. And this is the real and imaginary component, the Fourier transform. And the important thing of the phase spectral phasor is a model free, does not require previous knowledge. In, it combines basically the traditional spectral analysis with the phasor analysis. And it can be done in qubit or in imaging. And I will try to convince you that, in particular, for molecules that can, you know, interact with the environment, is really, really valuable because we will not know, and it will be very difficult to propose a model for the spectra that we will have in a cell. So, just uh, to illustrate how this look, uh, what are the properties, how this look like? Well, if we simulate three Gaussian curves and we transform this Gaussian curve here, you see that they appear in the phasor as changing in cortex counterclockwise. Uh, and basically the first are the blue, then the green, and then the, uh, the red. And you see that the narrow spectra here is the one that is toward to the edge of the phasor. In other words, the broader are closer to the center. So just by looking the phasor, this is the power of this, you can tell immediately that this spectra a pixel with this position here is redder spectra than this one, right? But moreover, uh, the most important part of this is if you have mixture of this component, it will underline the basically the linear combination between the point. Um, as Dave told before, by the distance between the points of the reference and the complex mixture, you can obtain basically the fraction of you have or, or, or of this component in the mixture. And this is just basically applying the level rule. It's really, really uh, simple to do. Uh, it also can be done you know, with three components in, uh, in the first harmonic, uh, because basically you have the G and the S, right? For each, uh, uh, for each uh, uh, fluorophore, and then you have the summatory of all the different components. So basically you have the fraction, the total fraction is equal to one. So you will divide. So you can analytically solve in this dimension, basically three component very, very easily. One really important property of the phasor is what Dave also told, and it was the, you know, the, the, the new propose, pro, proposition of Enrico of the using phasor for imaging. And this is, if you have an image, you can transform it. This represents like a fixed uh, image of four pixels. Each of the pixel is one of these uh, uh, point here. And if you have this situation, you can then come to the image and select a region of interest with these circles that we call cursors. And then you will highlight on an image what are the, these, these pixels with this characteristic, with this a spectral characteristic or with this many component. And this is very important because when we are working in images, we have millions of pixels or even billions of pixels if we have, you know, CT stack, time lapse, et cetera. And it will be very, very hard and very demanding to use, you know, regular and mixing or these kind of things. So this is one of the big, 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 big points of the uh, uh, of the phasor, which is called the reciprocity principle. You can go in one direction, you can go to the phasor, transform the data, and then select a region in the phasor and see where this data in the image. And the other way around is too. If in another round you can you want to select a region of interest in your image and see what is the specific phasor for this, is also true. So you can go back and forth and take advantage of this. So we can also get higher harmonics, and this is uh, uh, important for the end of the talk, because with higher harmonic, we will get a new round of positions, as they also show uh, in the lifetime phasor, and this will give extra equation to solve more component. And I will explain at the end. Uh, what we have to take care of, uh, some consideration of acquiring, well, the, the big, big consideration is saturation, because if we saturate our spectra, it will be changed the position in the phasor because you will be capturing the center of mass, right? So, and I, I, I illustrate this in this experiment, this is the same set of data, 
with uh, no saturation, small saturation, high saturation. And you will see that the plot, I plot all the data here. The data look like a cluster like this. These are all the pixels in the image. And then if I place, you know, circles, these uh, cursors, this will highlight different region. And you see that the position of the, uh, of the pixels in the face or change over the saturation. And they can basically go to another completely different position that you expect just because you are not collecting the proper spectra. The other important point is, well, how many channels I need? No, it's better if I have higher number of channels instead of, you know, three, four, five, six, 10, 12, how many? Well, somehow the ideal situation is this 32 channel that we uh, have in the uh, size instrument uh, with a resolution of 10 nanometer per step. And how we demonstrate that? You see that if we collect the spectra and we set, you know, cursors here again to see how we are uh, uh, highlighting the cell, you can see that in some of the cases, you get different position for the same region. In some of the cases, you get really a broad uh, phasor. And this is, well, this is first of all, because you are chopping some, some of the uh, component and this, it, it give you this uh, situation here. Uh, the other the other reason for why uh, is uh, is this situation is because here you have poor signal to noise. You get so small windows that your signal is very very uh, small and the noise is very high. So somehow, uh, in 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 base of my experience, the thirty two channels it's kind of the best. Uh, uh, array and the 10 nanometers seems to also to be very good for that decision. So to demonstrate uh, how powerful is this, I, I would like to introduce a, a group of dyes that are called dam props. These dam props were originally synthesized by Gregorio Weber and Faye Ferris. Uh, and the beauty of this dye is a dimethylamino naphthalene prop that you can give affinity to the uh, to the dye changing the R group here and you see that this R group can have different you know uh, chemicals and this will give you affinity for different subcellular or structure or organization and if you put this probe in a solution of glycerol and you frozen or you heated you can see by your eyes the change in the color and this is due to the relaxation of the solvent around the probe. And how, how this happened? Well, this happened because this probe, when get excited, enlarge the dipole moment, as uh, this arrow illustrates here. And if there is no uh, dipolar arctic molecule around, it will fluoresce, changing the spectra due to the, the electric constant we have in the surrounding, right? But the big, big change in the spectra is due to the relaxation from uh, dipolar molecules around. And one of the most important for biological system is water. So water can relax and the relaxation of few molecules of water can produce a huge change in spectra as well as in lifetime. So with this uh, system, we can basically isolate from the lifetime or from the spectra information that is very valuable of what is going on around this uh, floor of one important thing uh, before going in the, in the next is uh, for for future uh, also talks that I will give. It's interesting that if we look at the blue emission of the dye, we can observe the polarity the, of the environment, right? While if we look at the green part of the emission, we will look at the, the polar relaxation. So when we do lifetime in two channels, we can you know, uh, analyze two different biophysical properties. One is polarity and the other is the polar relaxation. And this will be important in, in future experiment. And how, what, what this, this probe for membrane measure? Well, Laurdan in particular got into the membrane and is basically located behind the carbonyl groups and is able to send a few water molecules uh, in the surrounding, which has a particularly rotational uh, 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 time, which is basically on the nanosecond time scale, contrary to what happened with the bulk water, which is on the picosecond time scale. 
And this model was proposed, proposed by Tiziana Parasassi and Enrico Graton in the 90s, and is what explained wh why Laurdan is able to sense uh, the, the change in the physical properties of the membrane. Well, the reason for why it changed is because when the membrane changed the phases, it changed the number of water you have in the interface, and this water is basically producing the relaxation. And I illustrate this here in this example, where in a cuvette with vesicles that has Laurdan, and if I increase the temperature, you can see that there is a shift from this 440 to 490. And this is due to the phase transition the membrane is, uh, is suffering. So additionally, the analysis of the Laurdan was done by this uh, formula, which is called uh, generalized polarization, also introduced by uh, Tiziana Parasassi and Enrico. And what they propose is to do basically the ratio of the intensity at 440 and 490. And using this formula, we can take opportunity of the anisotropy uh, uh, properties. We are not using polarization. We are using just two channels. But the properties of the polarization is, is additive. So if you have a position, you know, uh, in the uh, uh, a membrane with the shell uh, uh, component or a membrane with a liquid component, you can eventually have the fraction of each and another. This is true by a middle because when you have one membrane fluid and one membrane solid, they influence each other, and this beginning and end on the GP are not truly, you know, uh, val uh, uh, valid anymore. So. In this, you cannot do this easily in, 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 in the experiment. Uh, but uh, in the, in the basically 2000, uh, a big friend of mine and colleague that unfortunately we lost very, very short in time. And this is a good opportunity to remember him, Luis Vagatoli, who was the person to translate uh, the experiment in Cubet to imaging. And Luis, grow these uh, giant numerical vesicles that was uh, they were labeled with Laurdan. And then when they uh, um, uh, make a phase transition by decreasing the temperature, you can see that you can go from fluid, uh, which is basically because you have a low GP, to a more order membrane, which is a high GP. Uh, you see in the formula that if this increase, the blue increase means shell. And the, if the green increases, mean uh, fluid. And Luis was one of the was the pioneer doing this, and he was a person that really span and take advantage of this tool and demonstrate the value of all this uh, approximation. Um, but let me show you how Phasor can help a lot in this in this sense. Um, Well, if we have a very simple example, let's start for very simple example, basically two components. We have vesicles with a um, phospholipid, which is fluid, phospholipid, which is solid, and then we increase the concentration of cholesterol, and we acquire the spectra, and then we calculate the GP. You see that you get some sort of a curve here that I illustrate here just by drawing some line, and you can immediately notice that it's kind of a weird behavior that you need to propose a physical model to understand why you have some sort of, uh, you know, sinusoidal behavior here, etc. But let's take a look what happened with the phaser. And with the phaser, everything came very, very simple. So you are going for a, from, from a place which is fluid, shell, and then as much cholesterol you increase, you go to or liquid order, and all the other points are just linear combination of this point and this point. So basically, the membrane behaves very, very simple way, and you have two components. And there is no discussion about that. The phaser is telling you there, is, there was no assumption, there was no a priori knowledge, nothing. And this is the power of the phaser and the spectral phaser. But what happens when we have more than two components? Well, if you have a system very complicated like pulmonary surfactant, and you have like 100 lipids and four proteins associated to the pulmonary surfactant, and you phase transition the system with increasing temperature, you got this GP curve. And with the phasor, it's immediately noticeable that you have 
from the order to the fluid uh, trajectory, which does not follow uh, the light. And these little bars are errors. So you can see that it's bended. And this is because there is at least some other component uh, where Laudan find a different environment and explain basically why this is this bending. Uh, for complex system, uh, I was interested during my, my PhD to understand uh, the organization of these organelles uh, within the alveolus. Uh, these are uh, the lamellar bodies. These are the organelles that storage and secrete the pulmonary surfactant, which is a substance intended to reduce the tension during the, our breath. And there was a previous publication that explained that these organelles were very, very uh, high packet and deshydrated, and they assigned these to, uh, you know, shell phases. And we were working at more or less at the same time, uh, and we wanted to uh, propose one or to understand this using the phasers. And one of the questions that we have during this work was to demonstrate that our organelles in these uh, cells this is uh, an immortalized cell line that produced this uh, liquid uh, uh, lamellar bodies. Uh, there were truly lamellar bodies. This was a question from a review, reviewer, sorry. Uh, and we got basically a, a molecular marker. This is the ABC3. This is a transporter that filled the, lam the lamellar bodies with phospholipids. And basically they, this was labeled with, uh, uh, with the EGFP. And we transfect our cell and we immediately notice that these are the organelles that we were uh, um, speaking. But we wanted to connect this with the Laurdan information that we were studying. And unfortunately for us, this is a trajectory for the Laurdan. And you see that the point for the GFP is in the same line of the trajectory of Laurdan. So we cannot combine the Laurdan different uh, component with a third component in order to see if these lamellar bodies are more fluid or more order, et cetera, right? So what, what basically we decide to do is to move forward and take advantage of other dye that can be better combined with the uh, position in the face of EGFP. And this dye is the Nile Red, it's another uh, uh, membrane label uh, dye that can be basically uh, is redder, so it show up in the face or a little bit uh, farther. And you see that if we co-label uh, um, cells with Laurdan and with the night red, what we will have is a linear combination between the different components. We have Laurdan, uh, non-relax, Laurdan, relax here in blue and red, respectively. And then we have night red, relax, and night red, and relax. And what is the expectation? The expectation is to have a linear combination between the four components we have here. And you see that the unrelax, the unrelax and the unrelax of Laurdan and Night Red are in the linear combination, as well of the relaxed part of the Laurdan and the Night Red. So we demonstrate that we can use in one way or another the fluorescent from Laurdan and Night Red. And now we got a much better candidate to uh, combine with the green fluorescent protein, because if we do co-labeling of uh, Nile Red with a green fluorescent protein, we can look at the linear combination and form this triangle that help you to understand what are the different components. And in here, we can select using this cursor, the lamellar bodies who are basically in an order uh, environment and the linear combination between Laurdan and Nile Red. So with that, we demonstrate that, you know, this uh, is, again, a very powerful tool that can take advantage of a third component in order to give identity of one structure within the cell. And we will do this in the practical session using Laurdan and label cells with Laurdan and with uh, MitoTracker to study the membrane only in the, mito in the mitochondria. Um, okay. Then we did some other things uh, with phasers. Uh, and the combination of phasor and life, spectral phasor and lifetime phasor. And this was because we were interested in understand much better the photophysics of Laurdan. And, and if you think about, we can have an image in which we collect spectra and the lifetime at the same time, 
if you if you're lucky and you have a machine that can do or you can collect one after another very very quickly and then in principle you can do the transformation for the lifetime and for the spectra and if this is true there is a common place between this two phasor which is the image so if we select a region of interest in our uh let's call a master plot for the uh, spectral phasor we will highlight region of interest in our cell and then we can do uh with the software find where are those pixels in our secondary phasors and this can be done in both directions so we can understand what is going on in one a, a set of data and in the other and this is connected and this is very valuable for instance to understand what happened with the cells sorry uh, and in this case I am you know having the spectra and the lifetime in two channels and you see that this is the channel blue all the pixels are inside the universal circle because we are looking at the polarity while if we look at the green channel you see that the pixels are a bit outside of the universal circle and this is because we have relaxation of the water and this relaxation takes times and this is the reason for why they are a little bit out because you have an extra phase that pull the data outside the universal circle and this was very useful because then you can figure it out if the pixels that are red in spectra are the shorter lifetime and more relaxed in this or any other kind of conclusion you want to go but so far now we are able to go to basically a uh, three component in our system <clears throat> and we have a, a a possibility using this approach of collable you know louder than with uh, a molecular assembly uh, this is a, a polyq 97 this is a, a related to the Huntington disease and we were studying this is a collaboration with uh, Michelle Digman and, and Michelle Digman students, Sarah Sameni, uh, where we were trying to understand, you know, the Laurdan uh, organization in the membrane as well in the presence of this uh, uh, protein. And this protein was uh, labeled with uh, NRuby. And you see this triangle strategy, we were able to manage uh, to. Uh, well, to basically to uh, quantify the change in the fluidity of the plasma membrane when the cells are expressing this uh, version of the polyq uh, hanging thing. But more recently in time, uh, Florenzi Rigoin, a collaborator here in Uruguay, uh, was interested in uh, trying to label a structure in the cell, which is the cilium, uh, with different uh, fluorophore for different regions of the cilium. And unfortunately, we have two components with the Laurdan, and then we have one more component to combine. But we, we wanted to have more than one extra component. So we have, let's say, four components or fifth component. Uh, uh, so we performed this uh, collaboration with uh, Florencia, Paola, and Alexander Barmichana from uh, uh, California former postdoc of Enrico and now working in, in, in Arvita Bioscience is a company. He will give a talk today in the afternoon in which we were trying to take advantage of the harmonics. You remember when I introduced the formula, uh, I told that using the first harmonic, we can resolve three components. Well, the first harmonic is because here in this N, we introduce one. If we introduce two, we will have another set of C and S. And if you introduce three, we'll have a another. So we are basically calculating the higher harmonics of the Fourier transformation. With this, what we will have is basically a new set of data for first, second, and third harmonic, etc. In here, what I want to illustrate is that if we have, you know, five components, and then we blend it in different proportion, uh, we can have a position here that can be in the first harmonic, the combination between these three or the combination between these two. If we calculate the second harmonic for this, it's you know, undoubtedly that you will only have this position for this, you know, position, this, this, this guy here, it is not here, and it's explainable only for the linear combination of this component and this component, and not because the three other components. So increasing the number of harmonic increase also the capability of resolving many more components. And this is because we will have another row run of uh, a GNS 
for the harmonic one, harmonic two, and also the fractional. But we will test this first, and we use dice to label different organelles. And using these organelles, uh, this label, we co label a cell with five components. Uh, basically with a label for the nucleus, a label for the Golgi, label for the mitochondria, and then a label for the um, for the plasma membrane. And you see that immediately there are a lot of pixels in the middle of the original position, which means, and, and one component more here, this uh, Liso tracker, sorry. Uh, and you see that there are, you know, many pixels that are in the linear combination between the other, other different components. While applying these algorithms, we can calculate the fraction of photons for component one, component two, component three, component four, component fifth, and then the number of photon. And you can immediately notice that in the number of photon, the expected uh, subcellular uh, or organelle or structure uh, is highlighted. And then the multiplication between fraction of photon and, and number of photon uh, give you uh, degrees uh, of intensity that we will use to generate basically a new image, which is the, the composition of all the different components. And if we trace a line here, we can basically see that where we have one component, there is nothing on the other. There are some regions where we have a little bit of the both. And this is because these are, uh, you know, dyes. These are not uh, proteins that uh, are, uh, are target to a one organelle. But even for lysosomes, which are very, very small, like the one that is here, we can see that we can isolate very well the lysosome in, in, in our sample. But then we were trying to do this for understanding the organization of, uh, a, of the membrane on, of a specific organ. Uh, this was something that we couldn't do before for many, many components. We only were able to see the whole interior of the cell labeled with the Lourdan. So now, using this approach, we can calculate the component one and two. This is the loud and unrelaxed and relax, and then the Golgi, the mitochondria, and the nucleus, and then calculate the number of photons. You can immediately highlight where are those organelles. And using this, we can segment our image based on this map and obtain a map for uh, specifically uh, all the organelles. And uh, if you look here uh, carefully, you can see that now we can study the dynamics of the membrane specifically for the mitochondria, specifically for the Golgi, and we segmented by hand the plasma membrane. And collecting this information, we can build an histogram of the distribution of relaxation of the dye in the membrane, in other words, the organization of the membrane using this approach. And this is something that we can done, we, we couldn't done before uh, of this, uh, this approach. And this is another example of how powerful, you know, the spectral phasor and the phasor can be. To finalize, I, I told at the beginning that there is a new method in which we can obtain spectral information without acquiring the spectra. And what this means? Well, this was developed by uh, Sasha Dvornikov and Enrico uh, some years ago. And I will not uh, spotlight much the work of, uh, of Belen that she will uh, tell more tomorrow. But just to explain the concept, if we have filters with a function that remind to the sine or the cosine function, and we allow the light to pass through this filter, in some way, it's like we are doing the mathematics of the phase of transformation, but now with the photons, not collecting the spectra, right? When the photons are passing through, the, the photons that are, you know, uh, rejected by the filter is the same that if you have a spectra and you multiply for the cosine or this cosine, you are, you know, uh, calculating in, in the same way what are the uh, um, components you have in the spectra. So using this, you can do some mathematics and calculate uh, basically the spectral phasor. And if you have bits here, you can see that you can split very well. You know, one is orange, one is green. But also if you have a more complex system where you don't know the spectra, uh, like uh, in, the, in the mouse uh, uh, femur, 
Uh, this was previous described that have different lifetime and we can using lifetime, you can isolate two different regions. One is in more in the border, one is in the center. And with the spectra, we can do also the same. And this is very, very interesting and powerful technique that we are taking a lot of advantage because originally this work, uh, is it was conceived to be done using a, a diver microscope, which is intended for condition where you have highly scattering. And acquiring spectra in highly scattering, as I explained yesterday, is very difficult because photons are going in whatever weird direction. And most of the optical uh, element used for the spectral imaging fails in you know providing good spectra. So with that, I will conclude the presentation saying that, well, uh, basically it is possible to do phase on spectral imaging, yes. We can associate molecular species with the face or plot fingerprint, yes. And it's, this is very powerful tool. We can demix many contributions for fluorescent species in a blind way um, with no previous knowledge. And we can go up to three components uh, using the first harmonic, but if we go farther with harmonic, we can manage more. Uh, it's, it's interesting that it's very simple in the rules and you know, we can understand complex system like membranes. And uh, I will tell more tomorrow about Agdan, which is another probe. Uh, the multi-dimensional phasor is very powerful because we can combine lifetime and spectral information. And finally, this new way of doing a spectral imaging using the cyan cosine filter is really something really, really powerful that I think um, we will take a lot of advantage in the in the future. So with this, I conclude saying, well, faces are cool. And uh, I don't know what you are waiting, but I hope you can all jump in this dimension. Thank you.